Hi, everybody. Welcome to La Lista, a Latinx writers podcast. I'm your host, Ruben Mendive, and today we have a brand new guest here. I like to start every episode by having my guests introduce themselves, so your name and how you identify for the people at home. Uh, thank you, Ruben, for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Larios, and I'm a Salvadoran American filmmaker based in Los Angeles. My pronouns are, are he, him, and I'm like, um, to describe, I guess, like what I look like and such, I'm like a five foot eleven beigeous brown guy um, with really straight dark hair and prominent dimples and glasses I, I depend on too much uh, because I have terrible eyesight. Similar, it's a, without the dimples or the 5 foot 11, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I always like to know where my guests are from. So like when people ask you where you're from, what's the short version? What's the long version? Uh, the short version is I'm from Oakland, but the short version is is not uh, the best version for sure in my case, because uh, I ended up moving around a lot growing up. Um, I was born in Oakland in, in Fruitvale and I lived there until I was seven. Um, but then we moved to Cincinnati area um, in Ohio. Um, and we lived in a couple of different places there, like in sub- different suburbs. Um, and then after that, I moved with um, my, my mother and my sisters to El Salvador. Um, both my parents are from there. Um, so we went back there. Um, and I lived for a couple of years in El Campo, like in, in an area called like La Libertad, um, near San Juan Pico, and then a couple of years in the capital as well in San Salvador. And then after that, like I came back to finish high school in like the Bay Area, but this time like farther south, like in near Santa Cruz. And then after that, I went to Riverside for college and then moved to LA after that. So what brought your family to Oakland? Like, like why do they settle there? How did you come to like be born there? Yeah. So, I mean, my parents came to the United States in the 80s um, during the Civil War and uh, for both for um, distinct reasons. Um, And, uh, you know, my mom was uh, a college student and she was one of the better students um, in El Salvador. And she came from like a really poor family Um, and she managed to like there were some scholarships for kids to like study in the US because the idea was like, you know, they'd, they'd be able to like learn more and then come back and eventually rebuild the country post-war. Mm-hmm. Um, so she managed to earn one of those scholarships and come here. Um, my dad actually had a more cozy upbringing in El Salvador. He um, came from like more of a small town, whereas my mom was from the city. And but due to a lot of family drama that is its own podcast, <laughs> um, you know, that uh, he kind of had to leave home at a young age. And as a teenager, he left home and immigrated here on his own. And it's funny because my parents like knew each other um, when they were teenagers, but they weren't into each other then. But they they reconnected in the Bay Area. My mom was just looking for a place to, I think, have, have Christmas. And so was he. And they like, I think there was like a mutual friend or something. And so he, he had found work. Uh, he had like first gone to Texas, then LA and like tried his luck there and it didn't really work out. And then eventually found stable work in like um, the Bay Area. So that's why he was there. And then like when she reconnected with him, they like fell in love, right? And she decided to stay and they kind of started a family there. And slowly across the years, more of my family immigrated from uh, Central America and most of them settled in the Bay Area. So I, I still have a lot of family up there and it's still like kind of one of the places, you know, where I have just a, a large community. And, uh, you know, I, I went there for Thanksgiving, for example, you know, it's it's still a very meaningful place for my family. Yeah. And so I'm curious, like, what brought your family to like Ohio? Yeah. So that's the more random one. <laughs> uh, I, I we had to have been probably one of the first Salvadoran families in Ohio, like period. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, the main reason is is work. Um, my mom got a job offer that, you know, paid a lot more and living costs are much lower in Ohio than the Bay Area. I mean, the Bay Area is now like probably the most expensive place in the country to live. So um, it's not, it it wasn't always that way. Um, Although it was already changing, I think back then, but um, you know, it was like not really an offer we could refuse like as a, you know, emerging immigrant family that like didn't really have much to their name. Like we needed to, to make more. So my mom And dad decided to pack up and we moved to Ohio um, for that job. And my dad, who's like a serial entrepreneur of sorts, he kind of let go of his businesses in California and started a new one in Ohio that he still has. And uh, 
so so that was that decision it wasn't an easy one we definitely didn't have as much community in Ohio and it was a definitely a rougher <laughs> terrain to be um growing up Latinx in uh in the U.S. Yeah because you know I'm I'm from Chicago so I'm familiar with the Midwest so I'm just curious of like what what was it like like how old were you at this time in Ohio and what was that like experience like for you? Yeah I mean I was seven so when we moved when we left uh, uh Oakland and I loved Oakland as a kid like I remember having really good memories of it um, a lot of the more complex things about Oakland maybe didn't register for me because I was pretty young then and you know Fruitville has come on to have its own like identity really in the years that followed um, and uh, it, when I went to Ohio the main things my parents were like was like there's gonna be snow you know and I'd seen snow before like in Yosemite like you know for a day or so so I was like that's cool and then I, we went and it was like snowing for like four months straight and the after two days, I was completely over it. I hate the snow. I did not adapt well <laughs> to it. And then there's just a lot of, it was interesting because like the older you get, I think there was like a certain point where I became, like it was definitely a place because like in 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 Oakland, I lived in a proper like barrio, you know, like there was mostly a, like a black and Hispanic community, um, mostly Hispanic where I, where I, I was. Um, you know, the school I went to was called like Dolores Huerta Learning Academy, you know, and then I went to a public school in, in Ohio, and it was a much different situation, um, where I quickly started learning, you know, well, like, without knowing the words, what xenophobia is, what racism is, <laughs> and particularly how they applied to me, you know, in small things at first, you know, and then those things fester and grow. And, you know, I think as like, we all become racially aware and learn what our parents learn. And in the case of my classmates learned the racist things their parents probably taught them and stuff. Um, I remember um, eating like pepino con alwaste, which is a very Salvadoran like snack during uh, lunch and a kid like making fun of it. So I pushed him and he started crying and then we got sent to the principal's office and I got in trouble for pushing him and he didn't get in trouble for making fun of my food and that was not something I understood as like like a complex thing then but like in like when I was older and thinking back to that I was like oh he should have gotten in trouble <laughs> but um you know at the time that wasn't really something I mean still in much much of the country that's not something people care about having people be accepting of other people's cultures and and things so that was something uh, that got definitely harder as I grew up there and as like the friends I made started changing the way they behaved towards me and like kind of categorizing me in a certain way and since in public school in the U.S. right they do this really draconian thing right where they have you in A, B, C, D classes and A are like the top students and D are the ones that aren't doing well and I was in the A class and there was like only one other there was like 1.5 other Latinx kids in the A classes there was like half of you know kid who was half Puerto Rican but like white passing and then there was like uh, a white Cuban kid you know I was the only one that really kind of like I, I was the only one that spoke Spanish and that like very much was still like in my community and, and in that world. And it was really um, interesting for me. And there would be other kids that were like more immigrant kids that didn't even speak English um, quite well yet. And I would try to stay away from them because I felt like worried that I'd be like judged if I was like near them. And that's something I regret. Um, but I was like, I was like, because I was like stuck between trying to impress these kids and like trying to not be associated with these, I became like, I don't know, like a like a bit of a pariah to both in a way, and it was it was not comfortable. I'd say much at all. We went to like a, a Hispanic church, and that was like made the main like li like like Latinx community I had in that context. But like um, that was like once a week, and I also had very complex a very complicated and still do relationship with religion. So it wasn't always something I enjoyed. Um, but it, I think I'm, I'm in, in looking back, I'm like glad that I had that because I didn't totally lose like where I came from probably because of, you know, going to church every weekend. Yeah. You know, it's that thing that I'm sort of obsessed with when it comes to identity that I think happens to people in adolescence mm -hmm. when they're sort of othered yeah. of earlier than they're ready for. Yeah. But it's this thing of just like how you react to that. And also like, when you are sort of in a space where other people are sort of assigning different things towards you, you sort of try to like push back against that. And like, and, and that can sort of like result in like different scenarios for everybody. But, but yeah, it, it is interesting to hear that you like, were sort of like kept your distance from the kids that were even closer to you just because you were like, Oh, but I'm also not I, like, you didn't want to subscribe to like any individual box mm -hmm. that everybody else was trying to put you in. 
Yeah, yeah. And it was um kind of uh alienating, right? You mm-hmm. know, you find yourself like not really, you know, you're trying to you know what you're you know what you don't want to be, but you don't really know what you want to be either. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so you're it's like so it's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> and so you said that next you went to El Salvador. So what prompted that move? That's a, like another complicated thing. Like by this time, my dad, because he came here um, uh, undocumented at the time, and then he he got his residency eventually through like one of the many things that they temporarily did to create an, um, a, a path to citizenship. I mean, they haven't done that in a minute. They should probably do that. But anyway, he like uh, got his residency and eventually his citizenship. And my mom was married to him. So, you know, she could apply for, for citizenship as well because she came here on a student visa and then like got a work visa and then just kind of kept jumping from work visa to work visa. Um, and in order to become a citizen now she you know was married to one and that would make it easier or so we thought um, because the Salvadoran government I think paid for her scholarship they wanted her to come back to El Salvador and basically they wanted a return on investment so they were like mm-hmm. you need to come back to El Salvador and work for a Salvadoran company for like a year or something and pull them out of bankruptcy you know help us you know the way we helped you so forth and my mom was like all right I guess I'm just going to go do that that's my understanding of it I mean that like I was pretty young and the details are probably slightly more complex um and I'm, I, I definitely want to learn more about it but the long and short of it was that she left for a year to do that and I, and we went with her because at the time my dad was working long hours and I at the time didn't have the greatest relationship with him um and my mom was really who I was kind of closer to and my sisters as well at that time so I think we all just went there with her um because she felt like she could supervise us a bit better and my dad had businesses in the U.S. so he had to stay you know to manage them the U.S. government I think was like yeah after like a year of doing that work you can like come back and you know it'll just be like before and you can just get right on the path to citizenship or whatever so she did like, I think the first year we d- went there, she didn't necessarily work. I think there was just dealing with a lot of other things because the recession hit and my dad's businesses <laughs> were impacted and it was just kind of like a mess. And then eventually she did start working for a Salvadoran company. And then after a year that was done and she went back to the like embassy or consulate or whatever, the US one and was like, all right, can we go back? And they were like, what? Um, and so anyway, my mom, the, you know, basically my mom ended up being there for five years um and I ended up being there for four of those so that was uh unfortunate (laughs) but I mean it was a very important part of my life because like I I as in in Ohio was like getting so messed up and like filled with like racial racial Mm self-hatred you know so I uh it was really important for me to go back there and like actually spend time in like El Salvador and like really learn more critically where I come from the U.S.'s impact on where I come from and um to have just like a more critical understanding of who I am yeah so let's talk about that because I'm curious of like you know you're growing up in the U.S. then you move to a whole different country so I'm just curious of like how much sort of what relationship did you have to the country before then and then like I'm curious of like the the adjustment period the transition to like oh i'm in this country things are sort of different than where i'm from um well the biggest thing was that i didn't speak very good spanish when i moved to el salvador like i had just avoiding actively speaking spanish when i was in ohio and now i had like i like had this super thick accent my sisters make fun of me because they have less of an accent than i do because i was so adamantly trying not to speak spanish that during those years you know, I, I, so I had to learn really fast. Um, other things that like kids just bully different in El Salvador. Um, you know, like, <laughs> um, it, everyone has a nickname. There was kids who I was friends with probably for years before I knew like their actual name. Cause there's just so many nicknames. <laughs> I had nicknames. Like I had several, like those were, I, I think bigger distinctions on a more like cultural communicative level um, that like, I don't know, kids are a little more rough around the edges there and probably also have thicker skin, which I think was good because uh, I learned to get thicker skin, which I needed, um, especially if you want to be in the film industry. The bigger thing, though, is just how how dangerous it is. 
in El Salvador, you know, like within a few weeks of being there, my mom was held at gunpoint by like some like teenagers who probably maybe would have killed her, but some like semi truck driver intervened, like and pulled out a shotgun and, uh, and she came home crying. And, you know, that was a real wake up call that I wasn't in Ohio anymore, which is not to say there's not parts of the U.S. that are extremely dangerous. There is. And the gun culture here is pretty crazy in a much different way. But over there, I guess the casualness of a climate of fear is very distinct. Um, you know, no one goes out at night, most places, unless you're like in a group, especially if you're a woman, you don't go anywhere alone. If my sisters needed to go anywhere, I had to go there with them most of the time, or they would have to be in a group with a man present. Um, because like, people are unfortunately very, um, or there's a lot of femicide in Latin America and everywhere in the US too. We're not, this place isn't better. <laughs> um, you know, um, and there's, there, it's just, uh, it, but over there, it's just more pronounced and there's le there's like a less structures of justice that like anyone can really depend on. And the gang rule is so prominent in most places. Um, you know, it's, it's like a given that uh, to operate um, even like a small business or anything, you have to like pay off the gangs to make sure that they don't attack you or hurt you or, or you know um and you just have to learn things that are like coded that like you wouldn't have to in most places in the u.s um you don't wear anything with the number 13 or 18 on it you know especially in certain neighborhoods um you you need to know how to say where you're from uh in a way that like you know, so that they know that you're not like a rival gang member or something, especially if you're a young male, like you need to know how to how to like walk around like my my, my friends were also like walk like you're tough, even if you don't feel like it, <laughs> you know, just so people leave you alone because if they, they people can smell, uh, you know, they can smell if you're like someone vulnerable and that they can like easily mug or something and get away with it, you know, so you just learn to always be looking over your shoulder in a way that I don't have to here. You know, so I, I think I think just the reality of uh, like the constant possibility of of getting killed or violently uh, um, robbed is is very real in most places in El Salvador. Maybe not for the oligarchy and the rich kids, but like for most of us who are normal people, that that's just part of life. Yeah. And so, like, what did you actually do for those five years or the four years that you were there? Yeah, I mean, I mostly, I was, like, profoundly depressed. Basically, most of, like, my teenage years, I was profoundly depressed. So I didn't really do much. I was not a good student when I was in El Salvador. Um, I'm, I, I read a lot of books. Like, I was very, like, intellectually curious, but I didn't want to do school, really. And I kind of dropped out, sort of, and just never did seventh grade. And then I just came back in eighth grade. Um, and I mostly, like, watched movies, played football, like, on the street with friends that I eventually made you know, and like red books and comics and are like more like Anna manga, not really comics. I was never like a US comics person, you know, just kind of chilled out. Like I really wasn't um, that driven at that age. I was mostly pretty like um, sad. <laughs> and like, um, I eventually like made enough friends and kind of got a little more. It was weird. It was like, I mean, it's not weird. It actually makes sense. But like, it was definitely the time where I was probably the most religious too. And that's because I needed to believe in the and that there was a meaning to my, you know, suffering because <laughs> there's just so much around me. You know, there's a term of like third world religiosity where people just get more religious when they're in places of constant danger. Um, Cause you need to like the idea of like you, your life ending is a little more um, tangible and you want to have something to hold on to. So I think I was very like into that at that age, um, which was very fascinating, <laughs> but I was really not really I was not looking forward in my life very much, probably because I didn't feel I could. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sort of curious of like, you know, your relationship with El Salvador, having been someone who's like parents sort of like, like many people from El Salvador had to flee because of the civil war. Did you grow up with sort of that mentality? And then what's it like to then like move back to this place where a lot of people, the whole narrative is like they, they fled and then sort of come into the reality of that, but also as this like home country of yours, like just what are your general thoughts of like the country and like your journey? Through? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I was younger, I really didn't totally understand what my parents had gone through and I wasn't really interested in learning it. And mostly I was upset that like no one even knew what it was <laughs> mm -hmm. in Ohio. Like most people are like thought I was Mexican or, or Puerto Rican or, or Dominican or something since that was like, I think the larger populations like in, in, in Ohio of, 
Hispanic people and I was mostly upset like part of me was like wished I was because like at least they could have something to identify with it but I was like like it's like barely a country you know <laughs> to most people you know when I went back there and I got to learn more about it and the complex history history of not just El Salvador but like all of Central America really because like Central America I think as a whole has its own culture that like is somewhat shared and obviously these borders are like fictions made up by like white Spanish people like hundreds yeah. of years ago so like I think it was really meaningful me to meaningful for me to go back and like get a critical understanding and then that's why I think I had so much reverse culture shock when I came back to the U.S. because I was I, I came back having now known all the atrocities that the U.S. committed in El Salvador and just feeling like it was you like you guys yeah. fucked this whole thing up sorry and we're just walking and around like, here like <laughs> it's this great like like yeah. yeah yeah and like because I mean I there's a lot I love about El Salvador I still go back like I went back a couple times in 2019 before the pandemic luckily and I, I mean even though it's still dangerous and still going through a lot of stuff like to me it's it's still one of the places I feel most within my own skin you know and uh you know I I I, I love it there like the people are great most people obviously there's, it's always a small group of people, the gangs, the, the oligarchy that like really mm-hmm. ruin things for everyone. But most people are pretty amazing and fun and the food's amazing. The weather's great. The beaches are great, um, you know, and uh, there's a lot of potential that just um, can't be realized due to like a history of colonialism and of neo-colonialism, you know, and so forth. Um, but I, 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 I love the place. I do. And I, I don't. I don't feel, um, I guess I don't, I don't feel like I left with my life. I felt like I left with, um, I think my parents maybe feel that way, but I think I left with, and actually maybe they still feel this way too. I feel like a strong duty to like do what I can to like, like make it better for people and like do what I can with the opportunities I have here to make it better for people back there. So let's talk about you re-entering the U.S. Oh. Um, and you said you you did it you when you came back you finished high school right or you yeah so I'm for the high school years I always frame it in these like three questions yeah it's from like 14 to 18 you can just smudge the numbers or ages if you'd like but who were you who were you pretending to be and how do you think other people saw you at this time yeah I mean I had a very like two because I did the first half of El Salvador of, of high school in El Salvador mm-hmm. And then the second half in the U.S. And those were very different experiences. Um, Because when I was in El Salvador, as as I mentioned, I was like a very aimless kid. I mostly was just playing football watching movies obsessively and like trying to date maybe (laughs) like and very poorly with very little success um and uh I I really just wanted to be a normal Salvadoran kid I actually it got to the point where I I really wasn't sure if I wanted to come back to the U.S. and like I loved movies and I already knew that at that age but I didn't think that that was a realistic career path Um, especially while I lived there and I was like the kids I'm going to be competing with are probably running around with like cameras and laptops and shooting stuff right now in the U.S. like doing like I don't know Indiana Jones knockoffs or something you know because that's what I guess white kids like yeah, the ones I grew up with were and I, I wasn't even into those kind of movies <laughs> so I was just like I I was like oh, man like um I'm I'm gonna I'm probably that's probably not something I can really count on being a future for me so I was just very much like a no future kid just kind of doing my thing um and then eventually <laughs> I think I finally had like a heartbreak because I finally succeeded in dating and then that went terribly. And then I was like, like, if I'm just going to be stuck here, (laughs) like, like not doing anything, I need to have something more than my life than just wanting to feel like, I guess, loved by somebody or or like, you know, in that way or those things. And at the time, it felt like I was running away from like a, a crappy high school relationship to the US. But in retrospect, I think it was something a little more cellular. Like I just realized like um I can't structure my life around hoping someone will just like like me I have to like do something that rewards myself you know and for me that was film um but I was like I knew I needed to go back to the U.S. in order to do that so I suddenly became extremely motivated um I was like I like my sister found this like boarding school in in the Bay Area that allows you the church will pay a third of it off of your tuition if you work off a third of it and then you only have to pay one third of it for the remainder 
because I knew I didn't want to move back to the U.S. and live with family because I was just not in a good place with my family. Um, and I needed distance from them because um, I was feeling just not at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, you're, um, yeah. teenagers are hard enough, let alone like traveling between countries and readjusting. And it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I kind of gamed that where like I went there and just started working at the school. Like I worked as a janitor at the school and also in the cafeteria and also at the, at the front desk, like anything they needed me to do to pay off the tuition so that I could live at that boarding school. And then the church paid a third of it. And the other third, my family was supposed to pay, but we didn't actually have that money. Um, but they had scholarships and I earned some of those. Cause like, as soon as I got back to the US, I just like worked, you know, really hard to be a good student and to earn those things. Um, and I would just like, I would go to school, I'd work, I'd watch movies at night. I'd go to school, I'd work, I'd watch movies at night. And like, that was most of my life there. Um, I really don't think I had a lot of friendships yeah like I don't look back at high school like oh like those are the days like I'm not definitely not a high school idealist at all um it was very much functional like I needed a college a high school degree so I could pursue film in college um because I knew I couldn't really pursue film much in high school because I was busy so I I like um you know, just was working a lot. And I didn't really like the environment of people there. Cause at this point I was like super radicalized by like my experience in El Salvador. I was like, you know, kind of Marxisty and like, uh, it was a rather conservative school. Um, so I butted heads a lot with some people. And I, I also didn't like the way people socialize is just very different in El Salvador and uh, the U S. So like, I think I offended some kids cause I didn't really know how to um, again, the thick skin thing, <laughs> like, you know, I didn't really know how to people talk to each other in the US as high schoolers. I just didn't know that. I didn't know how to do most like social conventions. Um, so I really just kind of, it was like a bit of a guessing game of watching people doing things and learning how to do it enough to get by. It was like just survival, you know, yeah. I just needed to get through it. <laughs> yeah. And you're like an indentured servant for your school. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. Okay, so what'd you do after high school? Like, did you have a plan? Did things go according to plan? No, things did not go according to plan. So I, I got back from El Salvador and I found out a bunch of my credits from school in El Salvador. They just weren't going to count because it's a third world country in a different language. So they were like, no, like you have to retake a bunch of classes. So I had to take, like I was taking AP English at the same time. I was taking English one as a makeup class, which is ridiculous. And they, that class, that school didn't have a lot of AP classes as it is. And the, the, I think the academic affairs vice principal and I just didn't get along. She seemed to mostly like legacy students whose like parents went there or who were in like athletic stuff. And I was not an athletic kid. Um, so I, uh, I just did, I, I, I had no interest in like, you know, kissing up to her either. So like, it was just not going to work. So I got no advice on how to apply to college or how to pursue college. So by the time I took the like the standardized tests um i hadn't realized it but the dates for all the schools like the film schools i wanted to apply to had already passed so i i wasn't really able to pursue that and i honestly couldn't have afforded them anyway i i I, like i was kind of deluding myself that i could pay for something like nyu i could never pay for something like nyu or usc or even like ucla like it still costs money so i was gonna just go to community college but then that school's um, the religious denomination it is, which is the same as my parents, has some universities, and one of them wanted to start like a film program. Um, a couple of them already had them, but I wasn't really impressed with them. And this new one, I felt at least was like starting from zero, so I could like just kind of go and like somewhat inform my own experience anyway. And it was closer to uh, LA, so I knew I could at least just watch movies a lot and like go and like you know w- you know be near some place that where like all the new movies are playing, you know. So I went there um, because I got a scholarship there that was like a full tuition scholarship because I won some essay contest. (laughs) Um, Otherwise, I would have just gone to community college. Um, And then once I got that, uh, you know, I went to college and I was very focused on film. My parents didn't want me to major in film, but since they were paying for any of my college, they couldn't really tell me what to do because I took out loans for room and board that I'm still paying off. And, uh, you know, I, I just majored in that. And I told them I was going to major in business as well, which for a minute I did. And I quickly learned, I took one marketing class and I got an A and I realized that this stuff is just mostly common sense. And I didn't really want to do it, 
you know, and so instead I, I got, I still double majored. I got a history degree as well, but I felt like that was more useful for me in terms of learning about the world and like what I want to write about and like really kind of like exploring my interests more. So, um, you know, that, that was more, you know, and college was also a very focused thing. Like I, I had more fun, I'd say in college than in high school, but like I was pretty focused on my thing and, you know, maybe to a fault. Like, I don't think, <laughs> I think I should have enjoyed it a bit more, but you know, that, that's, it is what it is. Yeah. And like, what was the like family status now? Like, cause you, you um, said your mom was there for like five years so that she'd come back to the Bay area. So like, um, I think my mom, I don't remember if she was able to be in the U S for my high school graduation. I think she was like, I think like a few months before, I graduated high school. She came back to the U.S. So uh, she was able to see me graduate high school, which was cool. Um, And then she immediately had to take the first job she could get, which was in Texas. So she lives in Texas now. Mm -hmm. Um, And I go back to Texas a lot, too, now. So that's another place I I end up going. Um, But she just needed the first job she could get for money to, like, help our family. So she was there. And my dad still has his businesses in Ohio. And he splits time now between Ohio and Texas. And uh, yeah, so I, and it was kind of great for me because I, I still wasn't ready to be around family that much. Um, you know, I think I had kind of, I think I've always just been someone who's a little like, I, I, I'm, I, I love my family, but I definitely need a, a certain distance from them to like really um, feel okay doing my thing, especially because they never, like growing up, they definitely didn't approve of my interest in writing and film and anything. So like, I really needed to be able to pursue this without that kind of judgment hanging over me. So I am curious of like, where did the storytelling come in for you? Because you sort of mentioned that you were sort of watching movies, but when, um, can you sort of just map up that, the, the through line in your life of like, oh, I think I'm good at writing. Oh, this is something I want to pursue. Oh, this is something I'm actively like trying to make happen. So, I mean, the funny thing is that there was always, it was always there and like little things that like no one ever, like, I, I think like no one never really knew how to foster it in me when I was younger. Cause like, I wrote like apparently some little story when I was like in kindergarten. I don't remember this, but my parents have it still. Um, where like the teacher was like, Daniel wrote a whole little book and it actually like has like a beginning, middle and end and stuff. And that's like impressive. And then, um, I, I won some poetry thing in middle school and then I won some poetry thing in high school, but like, that was just me. Like, I just knew that there was like a small cash prize. <laughs> so like, I just wanted to write something so I could get money. Um, but it was not something I I, caught, I could really think about as a career. I knew filmmaking I wanted to do. Um, and then when I went to college, I kind of, and even in high school, like I realized there was kids who, you know, had had like, final cut and like an SLR and had been shooting projects for years now. And I just didn't have the technological capacity or like the the exposure really to like, I feel to compete with like that with like in the technical things. And I didn't have the money to get the equipment necessary to. Um, So to me, um, I was trying to find my place in film that made sense for me. I was thinking maybe producing because that's more businessy and my parents would maybe approve of that. Um, but that alone was also not a reason to do it. Um, and then, um, I, the first film class I signed up for was a short screenwriting class and I did it and I was like, I did really well. And I got like, you know, a, a really good grade. And my teacher after was like, my professor after was like, Daniel, like you're a writer, <laughs> like you should do this. And I hadn't really thought about it, but I was like really flattered. And I was like, I get, I, I'm, I'm, I, I decided to run with it, you know? I had never really, I've never felt like I've had a talent. Like there's kids that like are good at things. And I never felt I was a kid that was like, good at a thing. I was just kind of existing. Um, so it meant a lot to me. And I was like, if I start now and do nothing but write, I'll eventually be good at this. <laughs> like good enough at this, maybe that I can be known for it. Or like people can can see that in me. You know, that's all I did after that. And I knew I could do it because writing is cheap. You know, mm-hmm. writing is doesn't cost money. You don't need a ton of equipment. You just need to know screenwriting. You just need to know format and you just run with it. And in some sense, I was always writing. I just hadn't really thought of it that way um, as like a creative outlet. Um, and so it meant a lot to me to be able to like finally have something that I felt I could express myself with. Yeah. And so like, when did you start making your own films? And like, what, what was coming out? What were you writing about? What were the stories you were telling? In college from the jump, I knew I wanted, I knew I was writing stuff about like 
a lot of stuff that was maybe a little more topical than what I write now, but definitely still dealing with like things of identity and poverty and violence and things that I felt like were wrong with the world. Um, and it particularly, as, and maybe not as personally at first, but increasingly personal, the more I got into it. And I think that's also paralleled my interest in, in eventually wanting to also direct my own writing. Um, and, uh, because I kept writing for other people, other students, and I would pitch them like my idea and they'd be like, that's great. Let's do something else instead. And they'd want to do like a, um, usually it felt like a, like a parody of like a, a real film or like a, or like a switched out cheap version of a film that already exists. And like, um, it felt very like impersonal and uninteresting to me. And then sometimes I would write something that like I liked and give it to them. And what kept happening was that they'd either finish the project and it wasn't very good um, or even trying to be, um, they'd finish the project and they'd never show it to me or even give me a copy, <laughs> you know, and that got really frustrating. Um, so I, I was like, if anyone's going to ruin my scripts, it might as well be me. <laughs> And so that's why I started directing. Honestly, that was the only reason. Like I like it was towards the end of college. I didn't really study directing. It was too late. Um, I had basically already finished my film degree by like junior year, and I was just finishing up my history degree. And which like humanities classes are easy, so I was just like uh, I had time to like try to make a short film and write something that was like if I have. Um, I was like, I don't come for money. Like I'm gonna be in the real world after this and not able to like have equipment. So I need to like, cause I had to quit access to equipment from the school, which wasn't like greatest equipment, but it was like equipment, you know, I regret not using it more now in retrospect, mm -hmm. but oh, there's a lot of regret, but you know, it is what it is. You're learning. Um, yeah. And I say regret, not with that much weight, yeah. I should say it's more like, of just like, a, Oh, that would have been a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, cause like, what's the point in real regret, but anyway, um, I like, uh, you know, crowdfunded this short and it wasn't like a high budget thing at all. Um, and uh, I wrote it and it was basically based on my dad's experience because he told me for a time when he lived in the U.S. as an undocumented immigrant, he lived like in a like a like a like one bedroom thing, you know, um, with a bunch of other teenage immigrant kids. And they're all just like teenagers, you know, they're goofy and stupid and like, <laughs> um, and still trying to like having to grow up fast, but really not really growing up because no one actually grows up faster. You know, people say that to make themselves feel better about yeah. being a crappy childhood. But Trauma. It's, it, yeah. yeah, but it's not true. Um, you were still a kid. And also when he first immigrated here, one of the first places he stayed was a church that like opened its doors for him and stuff. So I wrote a story about six undocumented immigrants who live in like a sanctuary church. And then it just follows them for a day, you know, trying to get by, hanging out, you know, cleaning, whatever, talking to family over the phone. It, it wasn't particularly great, but it was a good experience for me to try to like actually own it and to really figure out how I'm inspired by things. And I realized like these sort of like stems from family history, like things that happened to my father or mother or me or other people um, really are um, other people that I interact with. Um, it's really kind of what I ended up connecting to. Um, and that's really kind of grown from that project to the next where it's just like, I, I increasingly am becoming more interested in like generational issues and, and kind of like the way things happen parallel to each other in different time periods. Um, and like things that happen in my life have their own parallels in my mother's and father's, et cetera. And, and that's sort of kind of where I think my writing has gone since. Yeah, what's that called? It's like family pathology or something. I think that's yeah, what yeah, or just generational curses or <laughs> yeah, you know, just there's... inheriting everything that the person. Yeah, your parents are just dumping into you everything that was dumped into them, and you're just like yeah, creating the trauma and trying to heal from it. Yeah, or like you know, you always want to be different from your parents, but like the older you get, the more you realize you're just exactly <laughs> like them, and that's exactly the problem, yeah. <laughs> you know. And and it's also you know something you have to own and, and like understand. So the way you got on my radar is with your latest film. So can you sort of like um, sort of like introduce it to the audience, like how yeah, you, and how did you and just the journey of how you got there? Yeah. So my short, my, the the latest short I've done, which was has uh, been doing festivals and you know was at a number of festivals this year and hopefully a few more going into next year, um, is called Superstar, which is like superstar but with an extra e in the middle of super and star to like kind of um, you know. Um, 
inflect the Spanish accent of a person who's speaking English、um, with a Spanish accent. It's about a singer who is like an indie pop. You know, singer, and she's、um, emerging. You know, and she's in LA trying to like push her music, and she's at this nightclub because、um, she was told that she could meet with some music industry people who might be interested in her work.、Um, and when when it turns out that they kind of want her work to like staple on basically like a Spanish language verse on some white artist's music, you know, a la Despacito, like shoving Justin Bieber in and making him learn Spanish enough to do a verse or something like that, you know,、mm -hmm. um, she's she's very bothered because you know she really sees herself as someone who owns her her work.、Um, she gets offended and she kind of like stomps off to the bathroom. And you know, there's a bathroom attendant who's working there, who's also Salvadoran, and they end up overhearing each other earlier, you know, speaking in specific Salvadoran caliche in Spanish, and kind of identifying each other. And then, so when she goes to the bathroom, they run into each other again, and the rest of the film mostly plays out in that bathroom as the two of them start kind of, you know,、um, sharing and kind of connecting and just、uh, bonding over their mutual dislike of. Some of the characters, some of the men in the world <laughs> that you know they have to deal with, and also bonding over music.、Um, I wanted to make a movie that was heavy with music, and I, I'm a I'm a, a huge music listener and listen to a lot of music and have lots of friends that are in the music world, and、um, I really wanted a film that kind of expressed that creativity、um, and also、um, use that as a way to explore kind of. Uh, the way generations, like immigrants and children of immigrants, relate to each other and the different places they find themselves.、Um, yeah, and there's a couple places that story came from. I, if you want me to talk about that too, like、um, for one, I was actually it takes place in a K Town nightclub, right?、Um, and she runs into a Salvadoran bathroom attendant, and I, a few years ago, was very drunk at a take K Town nightclub and ran into a Salvadoran bathroom attendant and had a really good conversation with him. So. That's part of it, and then the other part of it is just when I was like working as an assistant for people in in、um, in film in LA, I I would often be at like meetings or at events where the only other person that really looked like me was the person、um, who is the nanny or who is like serving food, and I'm in, I like I have a seat at the table, but it's probably the worst seat, you know. And just feeling that the only person I can identify with is this other person who's meant to be invisible, and I'm just like maybe one note above that, <laughs> and just kind of like, what am I giving up to be here, you know? And is it worth it? And that's something I guess I think about a lot. It's kind of hard to not think about that in this town and this industry, and that's why I also like the film. Like even before I saw it, just the premise alone, I was like, "Oh, this this fool has like a perspective. He's he's trying to say something here." And I and I appreciate that because it's like a very like complex, nuanced story of like just people on two sides of like the same coin. And like I don't know, it feels like for some reason the biggest scam is like that we're all sort of just like very different from each other, but we're actually the reality is like everything you're going through, there's someone that's like just like a degree from you going through the same thing. There's definitely also an aspect to it that, in many ways, it's like a conversation between generations that don't totally understand each other. Like、mm -hmm. my dad doesn't understand why I want to do this. It came really out of left field for him that I wanted to like <laughs> be right and make films and stuff. Which later I found out that he had a poetry phase. So I don't know why he's that surprised. But I didn't know that at the time.、Uh, this was something I guess he did like very like shyly when he was in his younger twenties. I was like, "Come on!" But like he never told me about that. My mom had to be the one that told me about that. But you know, when my dad was living in LA, his life was radically different than mine. You know, he was working construction and hanging out ho outside Home Depot trying to get work, and you know,、um, you know, was unhoused for a bit. You know, and then for me, I'm I like you know I'm hanging on like it's pretty rough out here and like. Most places don't pay that well, like, but like I, I'm, I'm trying to do it, and I'm like trying to like pursue something that was does not seem practical, you know, to him. And at the same time,、uh, I really respect what he went through here, and I think he's learned to really respect what I'm going through now. And I think the the conversation that they two the two have is like that, you know. This bathroom attendant doesn't understand what this girl's pursuing, but she knows that music has value, and she knows that music has value. Um, for her daughter and for herself, and that you know it's something she used to like when she was younger, but it's just not something that's a real thing to her, you know. And for this girl, she's very、um, 
you know, sucked up in her own mission to like elevate her music that she does have some blinders on and she's probably not the most, you know, like Miranda is definitely not perfect. You know, she's very self-involved with her work and it really kind of, even to the point that she kind of risks putting the bathroom attendant in an awkward situation, you know? And it's about understanding that like her needs are different than mine and I have to respect them. And I think that was something that was important for me in the film to have this like cross-generational understanding of like, you are able to pursue this because of what people like me have to put down and vice versa. Yeah. And that's sort of what I, I've sort of been talking to people more, more about, especially in like LA and Hollywood. It's just like, for some people, it may seem very, it might seem easier now the, the path forward, but also that path has been laid for you by someone else. Yeah. Um, and I think it's the same thing with like, your parents like if they're immigrants or or anything it's like you're walking down you're not walking two distinct paths you know the journey is very similar it's just like just a different time period maybe different circumstances but and i i recommend this to everybody who has immigrant parents it's like you should be comparing notes because your parents have been doing this and sort of learning and, and adjusting to this country and how it works and just because you were born here it gives you a little bit but but you're not learning new lessons you know there's very like there's a Venn diagram of stuff that like interlaps between those two histories and, and journeys. Yeah, for sure. So I did want to talk about the, the technical stuff about the film. I, I feel like you shot it in break room 86. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I did. I like thought I recognized it. I was like, how did this? So I'm, I'm curious about like why this was the right time to make the film and sort of how you sort of put it together. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to make this film is honestly, because it's one of the stories I had in my head that was a little lighter. It was kind of, it's kind of funny and it's kind of sweet, you know, and it was something I knew I could really involve like the community with. And that I think really spoke to kind of the character of the Salvadoran community in LA in a way that I, I really liked. And I felt like could feel almost like a gift to like the people here. Cause I'm not from LA and there's a very strong community of Salvadorans here that have their own sort of, you know, growth of culture from being here. It's like the biggest mm-hmm. community of Salvadorans in the U S. So I, I, you know, and I'm, I'm really happy to come in as a guest, I guess. Um, and to, to be welcomed and, you know, honor that. I also, and the, the film I did before Memorama was a very personal and emotionally draining film to do in some ways. Cause it was, um, semi-biographical and I felt after that I needed uh, a break to do something a little lighter and a little more like kind of with a bit more like r- you know upbeat <laughs> rhythm to it I guess so it felt emotionally right to be the film I made next and I also wanted to do a film that was very character driven and very um, really lives and dies by the main the main actors in it and really like an actor's piece um, the, the previous film was not that it's like in many ways this film is the opposite of Memorama um, which I wanted because I wanted to try different things and to figure out my different tools and like my different strengths and understand them better like with this film I really was passionate about casting two Salvadoran leads in it and that was like one of the most exciting things because I kept seeing films that came out with like Salvadoran roles that like either weren't prominent and kind of you know whatever or they were, but then they wouldn't cast them in Salvador. And I could tell, which I think, you know, um, there's cases where it makes sense to kind of um, cast people that are, you know, if it's like a Mexican actor and you're casting a Salvadoran role, but that's not really a big part of the film or how they speak. That's like, I guess, kind of different. But if you're feeling, making a film like in LA, in like a Latinx community, and you need them to be able to speak like they're Salvadoran. <laughs> And I can tell. And there's also half a million Salvadorans in LA. So there's really no excuse not to cast one. (laughs) Um, And to me, I was like, how hard can it be to cast two leads that are Salvadoran in a film that can act? So I did uh, the casting call and we ran it for a month. And it was only like, I, I mean, I had no budget for this casting call. It was just through Instagram and asking friends that like have more of a following on Instagram to share it and so forth, you know, and to just get the word out. Um, and I found two leads that were great. So I felt very vindicated in having that opinion that like they, those were like systematic choices of laziness and of wanting to yeah. kind of just flatten out our experiences, you know, as like interchangeable. It was like at a juncture where I really wanted to make something culturally specific that was a bit more on the, on the happier side of my work. My work can be pretty melancholy and this one still is in some ways, but like, um, 
you know, on a bit more upbeat and just sweet, you know, just a sweet movie. <laughs> you're fresh to like a, this new thing where it's like, okay, hey, you're out of school. Now you have to build your own career with your own hands. So like, what's that journey been like? I, I graduated college in 2016. And like the first two years out of college, I, I, I shot a project like last minute with the stuff that they had at the school. Um, and then just spent two years like editing it and doing the effects for it. And so I, that was, and I'm just working like a minimum wage job, <laughs> like <laughs> as like a PA runner at like a post house. And then um, when I finished that, I got a, I got a better job um, after. And then I kind of focused on, um, on this film after that. And it was a very different process, right? Because like I didn't have the equipment from the film school, um, although they told me that they could like rent stuff out like cheaper, like you know if I like have a kid, P- like one of the students PA and like give them like college credit, then like I can also borrow some equipment, which I did, but not a lot because you know I I, I you know they, they're not a student there, <laughs> like I needed to you know um, get most things myself. Um, so like, I mean, I was saving money and we did crowdfunding for half the budget as well. Um, and it was really hard to save money and it was very piecemeal because like, I just, you know, I just didn't make a lot, you know, in the, in the jobs I had in LA. And so like, it, it took a while for me to get the resources necessary to be able to make it, which is just like a, a, a process of patience, you know, it, it was definitely hard because I didn't have a crew like the people I went to college with ended up not pursuing filmmaking and not moving to LA so I kind of moved out here knowing maybe one or two people you know and one of those people I ended up kind of having a falling out with anyway so like the the um or just you know we drifted apart so like before that film the other person ended up being a producer on the film which is great uh Brian but the I really had to kind of find a new community for myself and because of that I also couldn't count on like friends willing to work for free on it because these people were all strangers and I knew I had to pay people so I had to save even more knowing that it was it was difficult um but it was it was necessary for me to do that because I finally started to learn you know what it was like to work with the crew that actually is getting paid and therefore actually shows up on time (laughs) um and you know is willing to put the work in and is very professional about it and that was like a really good new experience for me and it's exciting for like the next project you know now I kind of know more the kind of people I like working with and I'm sort of like building those relationships with people that I'm excited to like continue making films with yeah and you know I know a lot of filmmakers some of them new newish to LA so I'm curious of like how what were some of the avenues you took to like build your crew um well one of the the most key thing was that I went to like this art this filmmaker meetup for people interested in music videos which I I am and someday I'll, I'll probably direct one um But I I still went because it was interesting and because the meeting was actually about making like the music video world a bit more sustainable for filmmakers. Um, And I met one of the producers of the film, Losa, who's like a musician and also like a a filmmaker. Um, And she was fascinated with the story because we just connected and started talking about projects. And I told her about the film and she was like, that sounds dope. Let's make it. And she had a bit more community than I did here in L.A. So um, together, you know, she found another producer that also got involved and we slowly built out a crew um, with kind of like their relationships and some of mine. Since I was working at a post house, I actually knew a lot of people in post-production. So those relationships kind of helped too. And we kind of just pulled um, who we knew, people that also maybe weren't, you know, working regularly on like larger projects, but aiming to get there and like wanted the experience of it um, and felt like aligned in purpose with the project. Um, so that, that was kind of how that went about. Um, it was very piecemeal, but, you know, it was really scrappy, but I recommend, you know, like for people who are trying to find community to, to go to like events that speak to things that, that matter to you in film, um, you know, and cause that helps narrow it down to people who have a similar, similar ethical, you know, framework they're working in, but also people who have similar passions and are willing to show up, you know, if they're willing to show up to a talk about, you know that's not like a cool talk like it's a it's a talk about like having equity payments you know for for directors in music the music music video industry they're gonna willing to show up to actually make a film you know (laughs) you know i'm i'm always curious with my guests like Mm -hmm. um you know sometimes as writers we like we're sort of trying to work out an idea in our heads and Mm -hmm. sometimes we're telling the the same story over and over because we're just trying to like really Mm -hmm. churn out this like thing that's sort of like a story that we think we need to tell 
So mm-hmm. I'm just curious for you, what are some of the themes, some of the through lines that you find always are popping up in your in the stories you tell in, the, in your work? Definitely one is, I think, uh, people who talk a lot, but never about the important thing, you know? Um, I think that's something popular and like, or just like very present in Latin American homes. Like it's the kind of thing where it's like, everyone's really talkative and loud, but no one, no one's actually vulnerable, <laughs> you know, um, you know, they, they'll say everything, but you know, and they'll, and they'll talk about everyone else's vulnerabilities, but not their own. Oh my God. Um, drag my whole family. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, cause, and you know, they're, they're like super affectionate and stuff, but never, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's a very funny thing. Cause like, um, like, I was talking about this, like with my girlfriend who's like, you know, Asian and she's like, I, like, it's, it's like the opposite where it's like very quiet or just it's, it's a similar issue, but it's the same, right? Like it's more quiet and like people don't, aren't as like maybe affectionate, but like, um, also don't talk about those things. And, and, and I was like, I think Latin American families are, have the affectionate part and they're very loud, but when it comes to the actual matters, like they're equally evasive, <laughs> you know, um, and just a lot of walls up. So, and I think, I think maybe like defensive, uh, talkativeness is maybe something that sometimes finds itself in my work more and more. I think I like a lot of dark humor because there's a lot of dark things about being Salvadoran for sure. And in my experience, we all kind of have like a macabre relationship to it at this point, you know, in in superstar there's a joke or like not a joke but it's just kind of like a comment like a side comment where she's like and then my music teacher was killed right um and i've seen people laugh to that and i've some seen like some audiences go oh my like like that's so sad i'm like no that was supposed to be funny (laughs) like that's you know and like you can tell where people are coming from whether or not they laugh at that moment or how they react to Mm -hmm. it right in more um i think thematic things though i i really find myself very preoccupied with like generational things and and I think particularly in my experience because I'm I guess what I I I mean it's a complicated word right but I'm, I guess I'm mestizo um you know I'm of mixed Spanish and indigenous descent and I did not grow up with a relationship to my indigeneity and it's something I'm like digging into to want to learn more about but there's so much uh, for history of forced assimilation and erasure of indigenous history that it's very possible I never find out what tribe my family's come from. Um, and that's something I like may have to make peace with. But I think that relationship is something I'm interested in unpacking because I think a lot of us, like, I mean, the way that works, right, is that mestizo is a way to separate us, separate us from indigeneity so we're less of a threat to whiteness. Uh, and basically it becomes like a white aspirational category, um, which is a very complicated thing. And I really want to kind of dig into that more with my work and like how there's probably a very deep wound in all of us <laughs> that Absolutely. we were completely removed from our history. And that's still echoes. I think the ec- generational echoes, I guess you could call it, is something that I think about a lot. No, that is so true. I think the first half about the family stuff is like, huh, is that what that is? And the second, I think you're right. I think there are just echoes because even this week on Twitter, everyone's like screaming about what we should call ourselves and like who's voting for who or whatnot. And I, and I'm I just I'm at this point so close to muting the word Latinx on Twitter, which would be a disservice to what I'm trying to do. But yeah, I get there. <laughs> yeah, just because I'm tired of people. <laughs> yeah, just because just because I'm, pe- I'm tired of people talking about the word and what it means. But I think you're right. It's just such a deep one and just echoes of like mm-hmm. this thing where we're not really grounded because we're like based off we're coming from countries that were just completely like like colonized and like and that that sort of like separation that you're talking about that you sort of feel I think we all sort of have it Mm -hmm. but we're so far detached and it's and that just means that they did their job like by design it's supposed to be that way and I think we're too busy fighting each other instead of being like okay how about we all just chat and like see where we go with this yeah, because it's harder to sit with the pain of it, you know, and just be like, yeah, we, they, in a sense, won, yeah, they <laughs> you did. know, for, yeah. for a lot of us, there are obviously still many yeah. indigenous communities that are alive and, 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 um, and we got to, you know, be allied with them because the longer we're fighting with each other, the less good we're doing for them, Yeah, you know, and it's like, you know, we have to figure out um, a way forward for ourselves with the possibility of total passlessness for most of us. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and that's that's something 
we have to, you know, it's a burden to bear, but the sooner we start owning it, I think the, the better we'll be at being useful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's the thing. It's just like, can we just be useful to one another? Yeah. Okay. So this is a very like question -y interview question, but like, yeah. And you tell me, I know it's a pandemic, so you can tell me to like F off, but um, <laughs> so I know you're working on the film, you're, uh, it's out, you're, you're, you're still working that circuit with it. Um, mm. So, but like, what's next for you? What do you have like? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I wrote a feature that I really want to be my first feature and I'm sort of putting together my like Central American Latinx dream team for it um, slowly. Avengers, yeah. yeah um, I, I can't speak too much about the details yet. Um, but I'm sort of in the phase where I think I've carried it pretty far um, in the writing process to where I really want to take it to a fellowship or residency and really like work on it meaningfully and have my ideas challenged about it. I had a really productive conversation with a friend the other day where she kind of really challenged. I was like so gung ho about just making it ASAP. And she's like, you need to give it the time it deserves because it's a very special thing, like your first feature and you have to be delicate about it so I'm like I'm, I'm like trying to slow down and like like start just a plot focus on applying to opportunities to work on it um and I want to make another short next year too well I'm, I'm making two shorts really I, I one I'm already like playing around with footage and stuff because it's a nonfiction short I'm doing like an essay film of sorts it's like an essay memoir film I love nonfiction, and I really want to um I'm naturally a writer so it's funny because like documentary you don't think of it always as like a writing form but the uh the essay film and the memoir film are like uh, a thing that really draws me and there's like these beautiful voiceovers in those if you see them things like Elena by Petra Costa or like um uh, Nostalgia for the Light by Patricio Guzman. Um, they're like beautiful um, and so beautifully written. And I really, I'm, I'm sort of working on that one. That one's called uh, Post-Colonial Pinata. And um, it's kind of parallels a history of pinata making with a personal history of like survivor's guilt of living in the diaspora of a very dangerous place and kind of the way kind of we beat ourselves up about our own identity hence the pinata thing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's the sh that short. And then I'm, I'm working on another short that the story is like not filled out, but the, the next fiction short I want to do, I know is going to be a love story, <laughs> which is great. I've never done a love story because lo like writing a love story, I'm a romantic, but like writing a love story definitely scares me because like there's so much chemistry and stuff, but I feel ready and I feel in the right place where I want to tackle that. So the next short's going to be like that. And it's going to probably have a lot of aesthetic parallels with the feature. So hopefully, you know, make it useful for, for being able to get that, that thing greenlit eventually. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what's next. Yeah, all, all that sounds amazing. I'm excited to see it. Before I ask my wrap-up questions, is there anything else we didn't cover that you wanted to hit on? I think one thing that um, I, I, I love noting is that um, in film school, I, wrote, I read a lot of things about how to write stuff you know um in like three act structure and i read like sid field and christopher vogler and all those people all those white men i see the value in them but i think that's like one way to do it and like i think structure is important in any film but how you arrive at it is very different and i think one thing that was helpful for me is that i kept writing stuff in those formats and it just felt very paint by number and it wasn't for me um, I think there's certain things that benefit from that, like TV for sure yeah. like benefits from that. And I can write that way if it feels right for the project. Um, but one thing I, I kind of had to learn was that there's, you can find other ways to inform the, 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 the structure of, you know, your cinema and your, your film and your writing. Um, I think poetry has been really helpful for that. And that, that, that's like kind of what has been on my mind of like finding inspiration from things other than the, the, the screenwriting self-help books that, you know, you can read in college. Yes, because, um, you know, I'm of the same mind that like writing is very emotional and you sort of have to like be ready to tell the story and then like sort of like have figured it out from that place. But also I was talking to a friend where they were saying like, this was about like academia in general, but it's just like, mm -hmm. and all those screenwriting books and even the business model that it all exists in is a very like um, specific perspective. And so, some of us that sort of don't fit those sort of like perspectives or identifiers, it's we're trying to like put ourselves into that slot. And it's like, maybe it wasn't made for us in that way. And maybe we have a different way. And like, 
I don't know, just sort of like stop trying to find follow some template made by some white man and just like try to like see what comes from you and your community and your family and like all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So with that, I do want to ask you, so who are some of the writers that you're a fan of? And these could be peers, friends, um, heroes, people you creep on social media who don't know who you are, but you're obsessed <laughs> with them. So who are those people for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely I um, want to shout out some of those poets I mentioned, like some are dead and, you know, from a long time ago and some are like newer that I've been getting into. But I really like like Claribel Alegria, Prudencia Ayala, um, Roque Dalton, who are all like Salvadoran or Nicaraguan um, writers and poets that I, I really um, meant a lot to me, Alberto Mas Ferrer that you know are 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 meaningful influences in my life that I I I grew up reading and like like being exposed to and like continue to go back to. And then I I recently read Carla Cornejo uh Via Vencios uh I I don't know if I pronounced her last name correctly. It's very long. Via Vicencio. But anyway, she's an Ecuadorian writer or Ecuadorian American writer and she wrote a book, The Undocumented Americans, um, which is an amazing like screed um about you know just the the injustices and the also amazing characters that there are in the undocumented community uh and it's just beautifully done i i i was probably the most like inspirational thing i've read this year and then i just have a lot of friends that are cool writers i have a friend ali cruz who's uh cuban filipina which i think that history is also interesting because it's all it's also spanish colonialism but like mm-hmm. in a different continent and just the weird parallels between that she's an amazing poet and also film lover. Um, and I, I love her her poems. Um, and they're very complex and also deal with queerness and and uh and Latinx identity and so forth. Um, I also just got a book by this author I was recommended by a friend, um, Quince Dalton, who's an Afro-Costa Rican writer um, that I'm really excited to dig into. And it's just like short stories about um growing up black in Central America. Um, and and kind of like stories of his grandfather, you know, being black in Central America and things like that. So um, uh, there's there's just so much good stuff out there, even outside film. And like when I was like, I, I ended up, I think, turning a lot to non-film influences, non-film Latinx influences, because I don't always find what I want in film <laughs> in terms of inspiration. Although increasingly, there's some really cool filmmakers out there making cool Latinx stuff. So yeah. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, but there's, there's so much good inspiration outside just, just film. And so where can people follow you on social media? Oh yeah. So on, um, I, I will say I, I'm, I, I, I'm really good at using social media, which is why I'm not on it too much <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, because I, I can get addicted. But when I am, when I am um, gun ho on there, I, I, I pop on, like, I'm not invisible or a, a hermit, but like, um, I definitely need like my mental health breaks, you know, mm-hmm. but um, you can find me at, on Instagram at um, a Daniel in distress, uh, you know, arroba a Daniel in distress, um, like a damsel in distress, but a Daniel in distress. Um, and on Twitter at Larios Daniel 13. Um, which is more boring, but the name is also a Daniel in distress in the thing. Uh, I have a Facebook, but like, I haven't touched that thing in years. It's mostly to make sure that my like older family members are still alive. Yeah. Um, And not on QAnon or something. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so I like to have my guests help me title their episode. So the prompt is a blank Latinx, Latino, a writer. In the blank, you can put as many words as you want. You can mix them all around. Just whatever feels true to you, your writing, this conversation. I also use it as a community building tool um, so that when someone sees your title, they'll be like, hey, that's like me. I should listen to this. I should check this person's work out. I think I I was thinking about this one. Maybe uh, you could go with a humorously melancholy Salvadoran Latinx writer. (laughs) You know, perfect. I think I think that probably sums me up. Um, pretty well. Yeah. All right. Perfect. I'm sure there's plenty of you out there. I hope you all connect. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're a melancholy or Salvadoran or just funny, hit me up. And with that, I want to thank you so much for being on the pod. You know, I, I didn't know that much about you, but I sort of saw the work you were doing and listened to another interview and I was like, oh,